welcome back everybody. Today I'll be finishing up my lectures by talking about commutators, conjugates, and a couple of invariants of the Rubik's Cube. I'm going to start off by talking about conjugates first. So, a conjugate is any algorithm that has the form A, B, A inverse. So this means you do a sequence of moves A, and then a sequence of moves B, and then you do the inverse of the sequence of moves A. So the sequence could just be a single move, so we could have like r u r prime, or we could take this to be one sequence, and then have some other sequence in the middle. So in this case, if we took this to be a and this to be b, then the result that we'd get on the cube would be this. So the first thing to notice about this is if you have some algorithm that does some permutation, any conjugate of that algorithm is going to have the same cycle structure as the original algorithm. So for example, if we, if we do just a single R move, we know already that this has a four cycle of corners and a four cycle of edges. But if we conjugate it with something, what we'll just do a simple conjugate, we'll say u is our conjugate. So we do u, r, and then the inverse of u. If we look here, we're going to have a four cycle of edges again, and a four cycle of corners. And that means if we, well, we know already that the order of the move r is four, so it takes four r moves to get back to the beginning. So if we do this conjugated r, it'll also take us four times to take it back to the start. So this is one, and two, three, and four. Now you can go and prove very systematically that the cycle structure of your permutation will be preserved, but in my opinion that proof isn't the most illuminating, it's mostly just a computation. But I, I will prove that conjugation preserves subgroups. So, let's say we have a group G, and inside this group G, we have a subgroup S. Now suppose we have an element G inside G. So this, this is, say, a permutation of the Rubik's Cube. If, if our group is the Rubik's Cube, then G is some permutation, for example. Then we're going to look at the set which is conjugating S by G. Now first, we're going to check that it actually is a subgroup. So uh, any subset of G is going to have associativity, so that's already one thing out of the way that we don't have to prove. But to be a subgroup, we still need to have inverses, an identity, and we need to have closure. So first, we know that S, since S is a group, we have the identity, which we'll call E. The identity is inside S. So then we know, uh, since S, or since, since this is the set of all conjugates of elements of S, we know that the element where we conjugate E by G is also in S. So we know that G, E, G inverse is in S. But uh, when we multiply anything by the identity, we just get itself back. So this is just the same as G times G inverse. And by the definition of inverses, this is just the identity. So uh, through this chain of equality, we can conclude that the identity is inside this set. Now what about inverses? So if we have an element, we'll say, uh, we'll call it S prime inside of this set. Well, we know that S prime can be written as a conjugation of some element of S. So S prime equals G S, G inverse, where S is inside S. So then what's the inverse of this? Um, I think this was in the, the first lecture I did, 
to invert a product, you reverse the order and then you invert them each individually. So the inverse of S prime will be G S inverse G inverse. So now let's check, is this inside this set? Well, we know that S inverse is inside of S because S is a group. And then this is just a conjugation of that. So this is inside the conjugation of S. So we have the identity and we have inverses. And now we just want to check closures. So if we have two elements, I'll call them U and V inside this set. We want to check that their product is inside it. So um, we can write U and V as conjugations of elements of S. So we'll say U equals G U prime G inverse and V equals G V prime G inverse, where U prime and V prime are in S. Then we want to multiply them together. So U V equals this mess. But if we look inside here, we have G inverse times G. So we can cancel those out. So then this is G U prime V prime G inverse. Now we know that since S is a group, we know that the product of U prime and V prime are inside that, that group. So we know that this is inside S, so then this is inside the conjugation of S. So now we have the identity, we have inverses, and we have closure. So uh, we, we've proven that the conjugation of S is a subgroup. Now we just have to prove that conjugation of the subgroup preserves the order of the subgroup. In our case, since we're working with a finite group, that just means that the subgroups have the same number of elements, but if you're working with infinite groups, you have to be a little bit more careful. The way to show that two sets have the same number of elements if they're finite is you need to show a bijection between them. I'm going to define this bijection, which I'll call beta, and it's going to start from S, and it will it, you'll, you'll take an element of S, and send it to an element of the conjugation of S. And um, the obvious thing to choose uh, as a rule for beta is we'll just say beta of S equals G S G inverse for any S inside S. So we just have to check that this is a bijection and that, that will tell us that S and its conjugate have the same number of elements. So first we're going to prove what's called injectivity. So if we have two elements, R and S inside our group S, let's say that um, the bijection, well, well, let's say that beta of R equals beta of S. Then uh, we know that G R G inverse equals G S G inverse then we can multiply by G inverse on the left for both of these, and this equality will still hold. So then that tells us that since we can simplify this to just be the identity, we now know that R G inverse equals S G inverse. And then again, we can just multiply on the right by G here to get rid of the G inverse, and we can conclude that R equals S. So that, that avoids a situation like this, where two elements of S get sent to the same thing in the conjugate, because we just proved that if we have the image equal to each other in the conjugate, then we just proved that those two things actually have to be the same. So in, in that case, these two points, which are elements of the group S, would actually have to be the same point. And then the next thing we want to avoid is having a case like this, where we have an element of the conjugate which can't be gotten from any element of the original group. So let's say we have sigma inside of the conjugate. Then what element 
can we take in S that gets sent to sigma? I'm going to look at G inverse sigma G. So what we're doing here is we're conjugating sigma by G inverse. Well, we know that sigma can be written as G S G inverse for some S inside of S. So then if we look at this, this equals G inverse G S G inverse G. So both of these cancel out. So then we just get S. So, so this element here, this is inside of S. So then if we apply beta to this, we can see by the same process here that we're going to get sigma out the other side. So that tells us that every element of the conjugate comes from some element in S. So uh, that's how you prove that something is a bijection. This might seem a little bit complicated, but if you rewatch it a few times, I think it should start to become clear. So at this point, you might be wondering, why do we care about this? Like, how, how is this helpful at all? Well, this can help us come up with algorithms for different cases. So for example, if we have the J-perm here, some of you might know this. I'll, I'll write out the algorithm to begin with. So this is the J-perm here. Well, what if we have a case like this? Here you can see we have two corners swapped and two edges swapped. And this is actually the same cycle structure as the J-perm. In the J-perm here, we have two corners next to each other swapped and two edges next to each other swapped. So we should theoretically be able to use a conjugate to set the pieces up into the right position for the J-perm and then use the J-perm and then undo the conjugate. So we want to get these two corners next to each other and keep these edges next to each other. The most obvious thing you might do is hide this corner and then bring this corner next to it, then bring it back up. And that that would work, but I'm going to use a different conjugate, and you'll see why in a second. The conjugate that I'm going to use is f r u prime r prime u prime. So let me write that out. I'll write out the conjugate, and then I'll write out the j prime. And then at the end, we'll do the inverse of the conjugate, which is u r u r prime f prime. Now, at the start here, it looks like this is just an unnecessarily long setup move because it, it doesn't cancel any moves here. But once we get to the end here, we can see that actually a lot of moves are going to cancel because this u prime will cancel with this u, this r prime will cancel with this r, this u prime will cancel with this u, then r2 r prime is just going to be the same as r. So our final algorithm will be... <sighs> I messed up. So. Let's try that on this cube, and hopefully it should work. And it does. And some of you might know this algorithm already. This, this is the standard algorithm for this case, which is called the Y permutation. But one other thing that you can notice about it is at the front we have an F, and at the end we have an F prime. So this itself is actually a conjugate. If we omit the f and f prime, we'll get another algorithm. So what that does is this here. It'll swap these two corners and these two edges. And this algorithm is actually what people use for the beginner's method for solving the cube blindfolded. So it allows you to swap just two corners at a time. And then you can use other conjugates if you, instead of swapping this corner, if you wanted to swap this corner. You could do a conjugate to move that corner into position and then do the algorithm there, and then undo the conjugate. So I'll, I'll actually do that. So I, I want to swap with this corner, so I'll move it down here, and then do that algorithm, and then undo the conjugate. And you can see it swapped those two. So this algorithm is useful in blind solving because it allows you to swap just two corners at a time. If you get really into blind solving, you'll learn that most of the professionals don't actually use this algorithm with conjugates. What they actually do is commutators, which allow you to swap multiple pieces all at the same time. So next I will talk about what a commutator is. So a commutator is any algorithm of the form a, b, a inverse, b inverse. And just as with the conjugates, your a and b can be anything. They can be any sequence of moves. And the reason that it's called a commutator is because it has to do with the commutative rule. A commutator, in general, if you do like r u, r prime u prime, that's a commutator. 
but in general, that's not going to result in a solved cube. But in the case where it does, where it does nothing, which is the same as the identity, we can see if we multiply on the right here by b and then by a, we'll get ab equals ba. And th this is called commutativity. So when your commutator equals the identity, that means that those two permutations commute with each other. Now, one nice thing about commutators is if we take the inverse of a commutator using what we've learned from before, we invert this first, so it'll be b, and then a, then b inverse, and then a inverse. And you can see, actually, this is also a commutator, just starting with b instead of starting with a. So the inverse commutator, you start with the opposite. Now let's look at an, at an example of a commutator. So let's say a is the sequence r, u, r prime, and b will be the sequence d2. If we apply that to the cube, we do a and then b, and then we invert a, which will be r, u prime, r prime, and then we invert b, which is just going to be d2 again. We can see what it did here is it only moved three corners, and everything else remained the same as before. Now, these three corners, they aren't all in the same layer. What if we wanted an algorithm that moved three corners in the same layer? Well, the commutator from before, it had these two in the same layer and this in a different layer. So one way we could get them all to the same layer is by doing an R2 like that. So what we could do is an R2 conjugate at the beginning of this commutator, and that would get them on opposite sides, and then we could do the commutator, and then we could put them back on the same side. So let's try that. We'll do R2, and then we'll do this commutator, and then if we undo the R2, now they're back on the same side like that. And it affected corners on the back layer. So if you wanted an algorithm that did it on the top layer, what you'd, what you'd have to do first is rotate like this. And that's called, that, that rotation is called an X rotation because uh, you two, we call this the X axis and then this the Y axis, and then this is the Z axis. So we do an X rotation and then our conjugate was R2 and then our commutator and then we undo the conjugate. And we could also undo the rotation if we want. Now, if you simplify this, this R2 R turns into R prime. And if you if you write it all out, some of you might recognize that as the standard algorithm for the A permutation, which is just a, uh, a cycle of three corners. And the way it works is we had two corners in the bottom here and one in the top. And this first section the A sequence, what it did was it solved this corner as if you were just solving the first layer, like that. And then we want to move this out of the way so that we can solve this other corner. So that's the B sequence. We interchange those two. And then when we do the inverse of this, we're inserting this corner into the right place. And then we just have to undo the B sequence. So that's fairly standard for how corner commutators work. You can try a similar thing if you want to create an edge commutator, uh, you can try, instead of using R U R prime as your sequence, you could try alternatively the sequence M prime U M, which is like that. It would be good practice to try to create a commutator by yourself, which uses this insertion for your A sequence in order to create a commutator that cycles three edges. It's a useful exercise, I think. You could also create a commutator to flip an edge. I'll, I'll just give you a sequence that will flip one edge, and I'll, I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to finish the commutator. One sequence you could do is take the edge out like this, and then put it back in this way, and that flips it. Now you need to figure out a way to swap it with some other edge and then undo that. If you want to write that, that A sequence out, for edge flip, that sequence was R U R prime U F prime U prime F. So try to create an edge flip algorithm with that. And then one other exercise you can do is to try to create a corner twist algorithm. So you might know from the first layer, 
if you do this sequence twice, it twists this corner. So maybe you can use that to create a commutator that will only twist corners and keep everything else solved. So try those exercises for yourself. Now the last thing I want to address is the question of how many corners can we twist at a time? So you might have noticed in your solves that it's not possible to twist just one corner. But you, you can twist two corners, as I just showed before, but you can't twist two corners like this. So what's the same between this case and this case? Well, first I want to define what corner orientation is. So we're, we're going to say that a corner is oriented if either yellow or white is facing up, if it's on the top face, and if it's on the bottom, then either yellow or white is facing down. And you could do the same for any other side. You, if you want to do it with respect to orange and red, you could do the same thing. Just replace yellow and white with orange and red. For simplicity, I'll just do yellow and white here. So, this corner is oriented. This corner is still oriented. But if I do this, now this corner is misoriented. And so is this. If we do just a single turn, you'll see that all four of these corners have become misoriented. In particular, this corner needs to twist counterclockwise to be oriented. This needs to twist clockwise to be oriented. This needs to be twisted counterclockwise, and this one needs to be twisted clockwise. So they come in pairs of clockwise and counterclockwise corners. So if we have one corner twisted one way, we need to have another corner that's twisted the other way. But how does that account for this situation where we have three corners? Well, essentially, What's happening here is two clockwise twists is the same as one counterclockwise twist. So if we twist this corner twice clockwise, it's the same as if we had just twisted it once counterclockwise. So here, these are kind of acting as one corner because both of these are twisted clockwise. So this is the counterclockwise, and then this is the clockwise turn. We could say a clockwise turn is one, and then a counterclockwise turn is two. So if we add up the numbers associated to each corner, it's going to be a solvable position if the number is divisible by 3. So in this case, we would have 1 plus 2 plus 1, so this would not be solvable. But as we saw, if we twist it back this way, then it is solvable because now it's 3. So that's the invariant there. The, what remains the same for the corner orientations for every permutation of the Rubik's Cube is that the number associated to the twists is always going to be divisible by 3. Now if we ask the same question about edges, it becomes a little bit more complicated because it's a little bit tricky to define what it means for an edge to be oriented. It's pretty obvious if an edge is oriented if you have everything solved except the top, because obviously these are oriented and these are misoriented. But how do you tell if an edge in a different layer is oriented? If you remember back when you were learning how to solve the cross. Some cross edges you can just put in into place, like this edge here, just by turning one of the sides. But an edge like this, it'll require you to turn two of the sides at least, like this. We, we could put it in like that, and then there. So instead of just being able to turn the right side, we had to turn the front side as well. And that's what we're going to use as our definition for an oriented edge. So an oriented edge is going to be any edge that you can completely solve without having to turn the front or the back face. So you can turn the right, the top, the left, and the bottom, but not the front face. Now, as soon as you do turn the front face, now there's going to be no way to solve this without turning the front face, no way to solve this one without turning the front face, and the same with this edge, and the same with this edge. So once you turn the front face, it misorients all four of the edges on that face. So every turn you make either changes the orientation of zero of the edges or four of the edges. So from that you might be thinking that the number of edges flipped always has to be a multiple of four, but you might have noticed in yourselves that, that that's obviously not true because if we have something like this, here only two of the edges are flipped. So how do we account for that? Well, the way that works is we can misorient four of them, but then we'll just replace one of these misoriented ones with one that's correctly oriented, like that. So then if we turn the front face back, now we've, we've correctly oriented these three, but we're misorienting this one. So now these two edges are misoriented. So that can help explain how this edge orientation algorithm 
for the last layer works. What we're doing here is we have this edge misoriented in front. So we're going to turn the front side, so now this edge is oriented. And the other bad edge we have is back here. So we want to put this edge into here without messing up our first two layers. And it turns out the simplest way you can do that is just R, U, R prime, U prime. And then we can simply turn the front face back and that will orient this edge correctly. And you can't misorient any fewer than two edges. Two edges is the minimum that you can misorient. So the number of edges that you can have flipped on a Rubik's Cube is always going to be a multiple of two. And the reason for that is, if we had three flipped like this, then we could flip two of them, but then we'd be stuck with one. We can't just flip one because when we, when we orient this one, now there's three misoriented again. And no matter what we'll, we'll do, we'll always have one flipped. So that's the edge flip invariant for the Rubik's Cube. The number of edges flipped will always be a multiple of two. So that's it. I hope you all got something out of these lectures, and happy cubing.